All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Majors in Quinn YouTube channel. My name is Annie. I'm the event coordinator at Majors in Quinn in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, that's an independent bookstore. If you're not familiar with us, um, welcome to our virtual event space. Um, and if you are um, coming to us for the first time, thanks for being here. If you've watched many of our virtual events before, thanks for coming back. And we also do in-person events at our store in Uptown every week. There is something. So um, check out our website if you want to learn more about those. Super excited to um, be talking about the new book of poetry, um, 36 Ways of Writing a Vietnamese Poem by Nam Le. Um, so happy to have Bao Phi here in the studio to interview Nam, and we're going to hear a little bit from the book, and then they're going to talk about it, and then we can take some questions from you guys out there. Um, if you're logged into your Facebook or YouTube, you can ask questions in the live chat during the video at any time. We'll get to those questions at the end of the hour. I'm going to introduce the speakers real quick. Nam Lee's poetry has been published in Poetry, the American Poetry Review, the Paris Review, Bomb Conjunctions, Boston Review, Lana Turner, and The Monthly. He's received major awards in America, Europe, and Australia, including the Penn Malamud Award, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, the Dylan Thomas Prize, the Australian Prime Minister's Literary Award, and the Melbourne Prize for Literature. His short story collection, The Boat, has been republished as a modern classic and is widely translated, anthologized, and taught. He lives in Melbourne, Australia. And our hometown friend. Born in Saigon, raised in Min South Minneapolis, Bao Phi is a Vietnamese American poet, spoken word artist, children's book author, arts administrator, and single co-parent father. He used to be a community organizer, but now mostly organizes his bookshelf and his cat's snacks. Bao, thanks so much for being here again. I can't wait to hear your guys' conversation, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Annie. Hello, everyone tuning in. In the big wide world of the internet, you could be anywhere. Thank you for choosing to spend some time with us to celebrate Nam's wonderful, wonderful new book of poems. Um, I think we're just gonna, you know, feel free to uh, enter comments, ask questions, you know, comment on how breathtakingly handsome we are. We love it. We we want to hear all of it. Um, Nam, thanks for joining us all the way in from Australia, a whole different set of time zones over there. We're really glad to have you. Um, wondering if you could kick us off by just uh, reading some poems for just a few minutes. No worries. Um, and, and thank you, Annie, for the intro. Um, thank you, Majors and Quinn. Um, I wish I could be there in person. And thank you to local and uh, universal legend Mal for, uh, for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, anyone that's uh, out there tuning in. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's a little bit um, coming into hay fever, high season in Melbourne. So if I'm a bit sniffly or sneeze, uh, that's that's why. Uh, this book is called 36 Ways of Writing a Vietnamese Poem. And each of the titles of the poems um, relates to one such way of writing that poem. So I'll just uh, kick off. Thirty-six ways of writing a Vietnamese poem. One, diasporic. In English, mind you. You think I write a yik na me? Shame on you. It was your violence dumbed me, smeared me, reaved me. Your war I don't remember and won't let you forget moved me from place and sufficiency, from everything I didn't know, I didn't know, I would have known, you would have known. Displace meant everything to me before the power went home. Shame on me. What do I know? What's Vietnamese in me could fit in a poem? Four, aegic, all-encompassing. You can't go far wrong with violence. You'll go far, my boy. 
you'll cross oceans, my man. Start with the fall, go back or forth, through bombs or boats, across all the killing fields of thought. You can't make it up, because it's all yours, by blood, by right, by wrong done to your blood. Hold to trauma, even if it never happened to you. You may claim it, your blood contains it. What happened to them, your parents, theirs or their kin, who don't talk about it because of what happened to them, is yours to take and tell. Their harm, your hurt. You may write it, for it is written in the very walls of your cells. Nine, elliptical, tangential. Tell it slant. Did you know you could make a perfect circle with only straight lines? if you honour every tangent. Hybrid of thereness and not. Asymptotic liminal event. Between space with no value, lines with no width. The Lyman defines itself. The limit approaches a white complicity an inference. Ten. Reclamatory. One. Me chink, but not so fast with console or condemn. Me chinked, self-chinked in pidgey hole and niche. Not clanny, hole, cleft, crack, cramped in here is and humid. It's just that in my mouth, says she. So right back on bed. Hand back, head, drop jaw, unkink that massive magic passage, straight and true. Pink, shut up, promise past the jag and glint and hard, oh. Gorgeous gorge for gorgeous dinky, not too tinky chink head. Oh, and oh, and oh, oh, oh. Eleven, violence, Anglo-linguistic. Appetitive, omnivorous, expansionary, atonal with smashed together consonants. It wants it all. Empire and industry, science, technology, narratology, transaction. One language to rule them all, billions strong. The standard, the first and first second, mitotic, mitogenic, mitochondrial, ceaselessly dividing, changing, charging. It incorporates all, exiles all. We become internal emigres, exophones. Our tongue, blood glutted, rapined, chrismed in Rome, hardened in old Germanic mouths, totalized, bonded now, to long Western bent, Western lexicology, logoria, lexithymia, Western grammar. Say it was said, what I will say, but not in English, in the norm script of pre-colonial Vietnam. Tongue, revolt. English demands, what is the function of each word? Is it pronoun, noun, or verb? Adjective, adverb. What is its action? English demands which is the subject, which object, whose tongue, how many, what gender or case? What is its article? English demands what is the tense, the mood? Is the revolting or the tonguing transitive? To, against, whom, what, and when has it happened? Will it? Is it? 
what auxiliary for perfect and or continuous as to whether might it should it must it would it english with its mind of closed grids demands answers data declension denomination but vietnamese answers i am all these things or any i am openness manyness at once ontology your grammar is violence your way is narrow exaction the way that lets itself be said to be the way is not the way nothing i say haha ha, is more important than freedom i'll stop there if that's okay bell yeah no for sure thank you for that powerful reading great great stuff man thank you so much um and uh uh, again, those of us, those of you who are joining us late, thank you for being here. Thank you to Annie and Majors and Quinn. And uh, so Nam, you know, we were just talking about how when Annie first asked me to do this, and I was like, wait, is this the same Nam Lee? Like, uh, this is a poetry book, you know, because obviously, um, <laughs> I, I know I knew of your work through this very beloved collection of short stories. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk about um, how you turn to poetry. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, seeing as you move between genres um, as well. I, I don't know about you, man, but I, I started um, in poetry. I, you know, went through a stage when I was um, buying books or, you know, getting them by hook or crook where all I would be interested was poetry and I'd be you know, reading through them, um, you know, if, if they were a battery, they'd be the most, you know, high powered one and they would like keep you running for a while. And so I got, I got max, um, you know, optimized, uh, use out of them. I also just was so moved by the, the way that they moved my body as well. Just the, you know, the, the breath, um, and the body, I really felt it, the blood, you know, I felt the, the beat and the cadence and the rhythm. And I was, I was shocked, frankly, by, how powerful that effect was. And so for the longest time, I was that, um, I was that insufferable guy that, you know, went around being like, oh, I only read poetry, I only write poetry. Um, and weirdly, it was actually prose that was, um, that was the detour. Um, and that kind of happened partly through mercenary reasons, I have to say. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I was um, just starting off um, as a corporate lawyer and um, realized very quickly that it wasn't for me. I wasn't cut out for it um, and I needed to get out. And so I took a year off to go traveling around the world um, as a lot of Australians do. And during that time, I thought I cannot go back to legal practice. I don't know what I would do or what to do to, to not do that. Mm. And I'm not sure that poetry is the answer um, as a feasible financial alternative to, right. uh, to, to corporate law. And so that's when I kind of, um, you know, foolishly, quixotically, ambitiously, naively uh, thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll try a novel, you know. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. I've read some of those. They can't be so hard. Um, and thankfully, one of the one of the great blessings of my my career has been that novel has never been published. Um, I did finish it, but it's 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 not. Yeah, it's it's, it's not for publishing or even for reading. Um, most, but from most that, writers, yeah, most writers have a novel locked up in a drawer somewhere, right? Like totally, yeah. Do you have one? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and I don't know about you, but for the longest time, I thought maybe I can use it. Maybe I can sort of take something out of it, or carve little short stories, or mm -hmm. streamline it. And in yep. fact, it was just this enormous um, uh, drain suck and and you know distraction from the stuff that I needed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until um, it wasn't until my first kid was born actually in 2016 that I um, allowed myself to, to get back into poetry um, because before that I've been pretty hard ass on myself and, and said like, you know, you need to just be working on the novel that you're, um, that you're writing. And I, I realized I couldn't really sustain um, the novel writing, especially in those first years of, of fatherhood. Um, 
but I needed to engage with language seriously and I needed to be um, working. And poetry, I gotta say, it kind of, I think it saved my connection to writing um, in, in, in that time. And so I've, I've let myself do it ever since. Great. So you kind of touched upon um, how poetry was sounds like very liberating for you, actually. But did you also find that there were like some limitations? Like were there times when you're like, oh, I wish I was writing prose or did that never ever cross your mind? No, absolutely. Um, it's funny because there are different um, inertias that kick into play at different stages of writing and they're different for different forms as well. So obviously with um, with prose, especially a, a sustained long form thing, um, it is very possible to get into quite a sustained um, zone or flow where you're returning to the same rhythms, the same um, concerns, the same register and um, you know, the inertia there, if you're lucky, is pretty strong and it just sort of carries you through. It doesn't doesn't mean that what you're writing is good, but the, you know, the sense of flow um, and and just rejoining the current is is, is pretty powerful. Um, I've had that much less with, with poems. Poems are a bit more of a grind in the sense of you need to find almost, um, you know, one flow after another, like even one, one word, one transition, one line break. Um, can be you know can be a tributary which you feel is correct but it doesn't last you know it it then connects to all of sort of the other sort of tributaries so maybe the better metaphor would be um be an oral one like something something chimes and it just feels like it's hitting all the harmonics and it's right and it's sort of working on all the levels you need it to work on not just sonic but you know sense yeah. um and illusion and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. but um I don't know the blank page for poetry for me is is far more intimidating than the blank page for prose mm. it just feels like you know the 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 degree of difficulty that you expect the degree of intensity um the the lack of tolerance for for fat or um extraneous matter um is much more you know is much, it's much harder in poetry and so i think that you know, there are different sort of levels, but I will say that, I mean, going back to what I was saying um, before, that one of the great things was when I returned to poetry, you could finish a poem um, and have that feeling of, is this, is this done? I think it's done. You know, I think it's, right. I think it, I think it is its own thing. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Of course, you go back to it and revise it and stuff, but that sense of gratification, sure. um, I'd forgotten what that felt like, to be honest, because obviously <laughs> <laughs> I've taken right. a while. <laughs> right, right. And you know, like with a poem, right, you, you write it and if it, even if it's a disaster, it's kind of like, okay, well, it's a disaster, but I feel like, um, and you can either just put it away or move on, right? Whereas yeah. I think with longer forms, I think you can get going and then like 50 to 100 pages in, you're like, this may have been a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, let like, me just try it for another 50, 100,000 yeah. just in case. <laughs> Let's just yeah, try yeah. it for another two or three years in case I'm, yeah. uh, you know, I'm a bit too, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm drunk or in a bad mood. Right. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, definitely. And I, I mean, yeah. do you do you feel... I, I, I kind of feel like more and more the stuff that actually makes it out into the world or into even a book, if you're lucky. Yeah. It, it feels like it's just the, it's just the, like the bit that is extruded from the rest of the work, which is just much larger and um, contains everything, all the drafts, all of the failures, all of the, you know, yep. the stops and starts. Yep. So for me, it's, it's, yeah. it's all part of the work. Um, yeah. It's just that what, what ends up making it out is a very small sort of like part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like we're curating, uh, all writers kind of curate our own work before it even goes out the door. So I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's shift a little bit. Uh, you know, I want to talk about, cause you, one of the things that you touch upon is Asian masculinities, but I want to kind of like parse out whether there are differences, um, in perceived masculine Asian masculinities between the United States and Australia. And maybe, maybe I'll start like very briefly. Cause one thing I've, I've come to 
realize is like obviously even with american audiences who are relatively progressive um asian american male issues are not very legible or well known right like um so i'm, I'm just going to take a minute to talk about what i feel my lens and my experiences and i would love to hear uh what it is for you as an australian uh asian male cis male australian um so i mean it, it's really for me very interesting so to give to, to give you a snapshot there's the the whole like who the western who the western gaze finds attractive right and you know there have been there have been many studies that show that in like for instance dating apps um the least desirable people are asian men and black women right like the those are the two groups of gendered racial bodies that are seen as like the least attractive in the western gaze so there's the, the attractiveness thing i would also talk about how you know I'm going to be very careful here. I don't think that Asian American men should aspire to a toxic masculinity. Okay. So, but what I'm interested in thinking about is what we're told is valued and what we're not allowed to be. Okay. So I want that to be very clear. Um, you know, be, because I think that in America, the threat of strength and violence get like, between straight men in particular is a type of toxic respect right it's mm -hmm. a it's a toxic masculine respect right and i think in in this case again asian men are at the bottom like no one is afraid of asian men except bruce lee right people are afraid of bruce lee or like now like tony ja you know like there's a couple of asian men that are scary but really we don't get that toxic respect from other men um i would say like not just white men but like also different men of color right like there's not that level of toxic no one toxic respect that comes from fear of physical violence mm. um and and i don't say that we should aspire to that no one should you know um but i'm saying that there are tangible effects right and i think you see that in terms of all the anti-Asian violence that gets inflicted. Of course, it happens to Asian women too. I'm just saying that it, with the lens of masculinity, I think people often don't explore like the, mm -hmm. that, that aspect of how a lot of that violence is enabled by this idea of like the non-threatening uh, weak Asian man in America. That's like a, like a, like a three minute snapshot of what it's like you know what i mean obviously there's much more to it than that but i think i'd like to leave it there and just ask you like what are the differences and similarities uh in australia in those regards no thank you for that val um yeah there's a lot there and man this year we, we, we could be talking we could be doing a, a week a week-long symposium um and still be sort of nutting out at the tip of the iceberg on this Right. Um, so many things come to mind. And thank you for, for um, laying that out there. Um, to the actual pointy question of the differences between Australia and the States, I don't know that I could speak authoritatively about that. I can obviously speak to what, what my sort of intuitive sense is. Um, and I think my intuitive sense is that there is a... Um, there is a kind of masculinity that is prized in Australia, which to me feels um, even more straightened and even more um, uh, pervasive. You know, there's there, there have been a series of scandals in Australia recently, and especially in Australian politics and, and media, which um, which have highlighted how obscenely retrograde our um, political and corporate cultures and sporting cultures still are um, and how all these sort of um, lip services that are paid uh, to, you know, uh, progressive uh, milestones and standpoints and, and benchmarks still feels very much as though it's coming out of the 90s where, you know, oh, that's just political correctness. We've got to do that for the masses. But Mm. Um, behind closed doors, we all know um, what's what, you know. And mm. just as 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 one example, the most recent example, there was a really high profile um, case. I have to be careful here too because there was a 
involved legal defamation and criminal case. But basically, it involved um, a political staffer who was accused of raping another political staffer, um, a man raping a woman in Parliament House in a ministerial office. And this whole thing sort of played out um, in, a, in a really sort of messy way. Um, the criminal trial was eventually um, discontinued with no findings made because there was juror misconduct. Someone actually brought in stuff that wow. they weren't allowed to and sort of, put, you know, contaminated that process. And then the complainant's mental health was so precarious that the prosecutor decided not to to, re to go to retrial. Um, but anyway, there's the, the bloke that was accused of doing this um, with no findings made against him ended up like suing all of these, uh, you know, media companies and other people for defamation. Mm. And in the course of defamation discovery, all this stuff came out um, mm. about how the media companies in courting him and trying to get him to tell his side of the story on national television um, were basically allegedly um, paying for cocaine for um, wow. the prostitutes, you know, wow. for Thai masseuses, um, for, you know, golf and stakes, obviously, um, putting them up in a, you know, 100K, I think, or 200K pad for the year, sort of rent free. Um, and some of the sort of communications that sort of have emerged just reveal, like, you wouldn't believe that this was happening even in, you know, the 90s, let alone in, in the 20s. Um, and so that's a very long winded way of sort of going back to this, this sense that has always been um, understood, but not legible in the public domain of yeah. a, a, a really sort of toxic um, locker room, private boy, mm -hmm. um, you know, bros protecting bros kind of wow. misogyny uh, yeah. that, that is so strong here. And it just, you see it in yeah. portrayals um of Australian men on in Hollywood and also portrayals by Australian actors who are sort of ever since the Russell Crowe days, especially sort of famous for that sort of that, that um, volatility, right. That edge yeah. of, of something is something violent is going to happen. Like this, yeah. this is a real man, you know, he'll mistreat people if he, if right. he needs to. Right. So against that backdrop, I think um, the, the notion of um, the Asian man sort of fitting into that, has been somewhat polarized. Um, mm. There's there's been a sense of a lot of, especially maybe later generation Asian men um, who just fully kind of um, superficially assimilate, and you know they 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 their, their accent becomes broader, um, their mm -hmm. friendship circles become wider. Mm -hmm. um, their concerns become more sport oriented or, you know, according to whatever vocabulary mm -hmm. um, fuels that particular sort of discourse. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's less room here. It feels to me than there has been in America for different sort of um, models of what an Asian uh, masculinity could be, could, could be. Mm. And I guess I'll, I'll tell you something that happened to me recently. I was talking to, um, I was talking to a, a poet who's a Palestinian Lebanese um, woman mm. and she, you know, obviously has a lot on her shoulders and a lot, in, you know, on her heart at the moment. Right. And we were just walking and talking. And then at one point she actually sort of asked me, she just sort of stopped and then asked me, um, you know, but I don't want to assume, you know, that, that things are any which way for any, any person. And I can't imagine that you, um, you know, being, you know, an Asian man. And here I sort of just thought, oh, what's going to come here? Yeah. Um, and then she said, you know, I can't imagine that it's easy for you either as an Asian man. You know, I feel wow. like there are a lot of, and I tell you what, Mel, like I, wow. I could count on like less than one hand the number of times that that has um, been verbalized or, you know, yeah. to me in yeah. person. Mm -hmm. And, it, it just hit me in the guts. Like I just could not, I, I, I then realized how, um, how much acculturation and armor I'd had to put on myself, Absolutely. um, you know, in order to sort of just like get through without sort of, um, thinking about this, I guess, or without yeah. 
allowing it to get to me or without sort of reacting to it in toxic ways myself. Yeah. This notion that someone, especially someone who was going through that mm -hmm. um, at the moment would see mm -hmm. that there is a difference and it's not, and it's, and it's one that's peculiar to, to yeah. us yeah. Um, was enormously moving to me. Yeah. Sorry, that was a super long answer. <laughs> no, and and thank you for answering and giving us an education. You know, um, and I can I can relate. Similar to you, it is um, so rare to have someone say, not just "I see you," but have a curiosity or like an empathy that things might be might be challenging for you in a way that they don't understand and are, mm. are but and, and yet they want to have empathy for you as an asian man i've i've totally feel that same thing i could very yeah. rarely has that happened and i'm almost 50 years old you know and so <laughs> um so yeah uh, thank you for sharing that and for me i think when i hear that it humbles me and I, like i if, if somebody says that to me it humbles me and so i ask myself can i do that for another group of people who mm. really need to be seen or is are just really needing someone to to just acknowledge hey i bet you are going through some stuff too you know um so yeah, the, yeah thank thank you so much for sharing that no. and, yeah. I will say that I mean what, what one of the things I do think is different um, and that I see is that the um, the way in which sort of um, you know different groups are set against each other especially in America feels yeah. very of America and very different to here yeah and I think that it, it can be I don't know like I, I have to say that I had very I had really mixed feelings about um, I'm gonna get this wrong but you know when the when the Supreme Court case came down about sort of the Harvard, um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know admissions policy and how it was sort of working against and some of the sort of, um, you know, the ex cathedra comments that we sort of saw from you know from behind the curtain, mm -hmm. um, and because of the ways in which um, intersectionality intersectionality works and the the very sort of savviness with which um, mm -hmm. groups mm -hmm. understand that we're being set against each other and so we want to sort of like show allyship and solidarity. I do Absolutely. think that part of it was a missed opportunity to, to sort of really explore these yep. very Asian specific, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, travesties and yeah. traducements that were sort of being made mm -hmm. um, against, against us and yeah. sort of like, you know, ventilating that in an, in, in a more powerful way. And so yep. it's sort of, I remember reading mm -hmm. that and there was another article I read during um, the Ferguson um, unrest where, you know the crowd i remember that reading this throwaway line where people were saying no that's a that's a black business don't right. don't harm that mm -hmm. and so this throwaway line was and so they were directed towards asian and arab businesses mm -hmm. um to basically um you know vent mm -hmm. their their very righteous anger mm -hmm. and i remember thinking again like that in itself should be something that is um that is talked about, contested, mm -hmm. ventilated. Um, mm -hmm. But I think in America, it's really hard to be having these discussions because there is such a sense of, um, you know, potential lateral violence as well. And so, yeah, I, I, I see how hard that must be. Absolutely. And I think that just in general, Americans are very binary. We're very, we're very dichotomous. Um, you know, we want to know who's right, who's wrong, that we want to take the side understandably we want to take the side of who's right and i think you're right that there are times sometimes there is a right and wrong right i think sometimes the and though i'm actually thankful for the i feel like few times that it's that simple but oftentimes mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about horizontal uh, discrimination it's not that easy and i think that um we sometimes take shortcuts um to talk about one another when i feel like that is a time when we cannot take shortcuts when mm -hmm. we really actually need to have difficult nuanced discussions based on curiosity and wanting to learn about one another's people when we're talking about historically marginalized communities in the united states um that's really when we really need to to have difficult nuanced discussions that go beyond um blanket statements because um, it is so easy for, I'm just going to say, conservative movements to appeal to the lowest common denominators of different communities and set us against each other. They, 
are just abnormally good at that. And mm. we like it's I think it's up to all of us to to really fight against it. So thank you. And I agree. And let, somewhat related, let's um, you know, we, you've you've talked a, a bit and, and your work very much plays against this notion of authenticity. Right. Like um which can kind of like related, we can kind of fall into this trap if we think about things in a dichotomous binary way, th there's a way in which there's the authentic and the fake, right? Mm -hmm. But then what is, what is that really? What, what does it mean to be authentic? Who gets to decide? What are the rules? And I know that you, you push against that a lot in your work. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk about that, that, that push. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think you're, you're spot on when you're saying that what authenticity the notion of it brings in is one of um of you know is it a fake um is it is it the real thing is it authorized who authorizes it and what that brings in is a, a sort of a an attitude of suspicion you know and it's interesting how that suspicion if you'd actually play it out across the field applies more to certain certain types of writers than than other writers i think um one of the one of the dangers of the the notion of authenticity um oh there are many dangers of it i guess but one of them is it's not is not sort of allowing for the fact that um in writing everything is performative to a certain degree you know there is no notion that is completely in and of itself real or true because it's all being sort of transposed and translated and transmuted into yeah. um you yeah. know into this weird sort of artifact of language where we're decoding and coding and the reader plays an enormous part in that right. and so that that notion of um you know what's authentic and what's not feels yeah. um you know very very vexed in that in that case and i think related to what we just talked about too mm. there is there is a sense that and, and a lot of it is subconscious potentially, but there is a sense that Asians are seen, um, you know, as being basically sort of interchangeable coolies, um, yeah. you know, depending on which sort of trade you're, you're working in. Mm -hmm. And I think especially when we're working in language, um, you know, in, in the master's tongue, in the, you know, the, 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 the colonial hegemonic, um material there is a sense that we're in an enormous you know gordian bind where we can't do anything without having to sort of to, to meet with the subconscious suspicion or maybe conscious sus suspicion that what we're doing is artificial in some way that what we're doing right. is imitative that we're actually just really industrious and um and you know, good at rote and imitative, and that we can, you know, um, do everything to the highest level, mm -hmm. except um, actually communicate the soul that's beneath it or whatever. Right. And you know, there have been studies done by this as well. Of um, for the longest time, um, you know, in in piano at Stedfords or in you know musical at Stedfords, mm -hmm. um, there would be sort of this bias towards. Um, this, this cliche of the of the Asian performer being technically virtuosic and proficient, but sort of lacking an in interpretive flair right. or soul or spirit or something like that. Right. And of exactly. course, it's something that is impossible to argue against um, yep. because it's so tendentious and mm -hmm. and, and and disprovable. Yeah. Um, you, and that, you, that's yeah. Sorry. I was just going to say that speaks <laughs> to the 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 stuff that we were talking about with the Harvard thing, right? Like these, these sort of um, these these deeply deep dehumanizing but um, very slight and surreptitious judgments against um, people just based on their names or their faces or their backgrounds mm -hmm. that have an enormous um, series of, uh, you know, ripple effects and ramifications yeah. sort of going on. And so I think authenticity plays an enormous part in this. And it's why the authenticity trap is so strong mm -hmm. for, um, writers from the margin because that seems to be sometimes the one place where you can assume authority and unimpeachability and respect um but it's also the one place where um arguably your um 
you know, you're commodifying yourself into exactly what the mainstream needs you to be in order for yep. the mainstream to feel what it needs to about itself. That's exactly it. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, just a, a really quick interjection here. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask questions for about nine more minutes. Um, those of you who are listening, feel free to type up the, uh, your questions in the comments. Uh, we'll try to get to them as, as soon as we can. So while we're talking about authenticity, so uh, for me, it strikes me that, um, you know, in the Western imagination, Vietnamese people really can only be one of two things, right? We're either the victim. Um, so, so think of like, you know, um, someone running from napalm or like mm. someone being shot and killed in, in the war uh, uh, or like um, a Vietnamese woman, like just uh, being choked by patriarchy um, or we're the, we're the villain. Right, so the the patriarchal evil man, the evil soldier, the the spy, um, mm. and you know that also is uh, is limit is limiting, right? It just does not allow people to be fully human. Number one, and then number two, there's the prism of war. It's like we are we're, we're only allowed to talk about the war. It's funny. I think all the different groups of color are only allowed one thing to talk yeah. about, right? Like, so, you know, like Native American folks could talk about like the old days in their land. Black people can talk about slavery, right? Um, uh, Latinos um, can talk about, you know, immigration and like Vietnamese people, Southeast Asians, we talk about the war, but that's mm. all. That's it, right? And so, I, I want to get though at attention because it's not like we shouldn't write about the war. We should, right? We we should write about whatever we want, right? So so it's not saying like because I think like doing the thing where you just avoid doing what you're expected to is also a trap, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. But, but I, I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about that tension and also I wouldn't even just say tension, but um, opportunity to play. I think opportunity to play with expectation. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I, think, no. and I think you do a ton of that in this book. I love that, man. I, I, I think you know the reason why these are um, beautiful traps is because they're ungetoutable. You know, that's the that's the whole thing. You you can't. We don't have the standing. We don't have the power. We don't have the critical mass, um, and we don't have yet. You know, the um, the cultural sort of like. Um, inertia or you know volume of tradition in order to sort of like um in order to do anything but wage a, a kind of guerrilla action or a, an infiltration action you know to right. to totally buy into your metaphors right. so it to me the only the only solution um is one of irresolution mm -hmm. the only solution is to be really upfront and honest with ourselves first and foremost and by that i mean with oneself but also ourselves in terms of whatever tribe or identity that one wants to um, affiliate oneself with and then with the larger sort of um infrastructure as well and i think that you know one of the themes that's come out from just this conversation has been that um things left to fester in the understood but un but unventilated mm -hmm. the privately agreed but publicly m muted um these things you know these 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 cankers they that they, they fester and they can have really really um long lasting um pollutive effects on you know the entire ecosystem and okay. so i think one of the responsibilities that that i definitely feel to myself is just trying to be honest about the conditions in which I'm working, the conditions of the work and then the conditions of the world, which might receive the work as well. And so, as you say, you know, of course, writers should be free to write about whatever they want to write about. Mm -hmm. And it, it stands to reason that what they want to write about might be the thing that they're expected to write about mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. If they if they write about that without in some way um addressing or calibrating their work to that expectation mm -hmm. then i feel like that that valency is missing in the work and i think it's also maybe not entirely honest because i think we all 
understand those expectations. We, we're all savvy and we understand, you know, um, in many ways how, how, how dominance works in this um, dominance behavior um, hothouse. And yes. so I think, I think one of the, I mean, there are many strategies for, um, for uh, this kind of seeing or speaking back. And, um, you know, one of them is subversion, obviously. And what that translates to for me is very much what you describe as play. You know, I think if, if we can um, look at ourselves and, uh, and, and, and indict and laugh at ourselves, um, look at each other and indict yeah. and laugh at each other, um, but incorporate a sense of play and even sort of, um, of, of joy into that play, mm -hmm. um, which I think the language allows us um, yeah. as well, mm -hmm. then, then I think that there, there, there is a different kind of register that can be reached that, um, you know, we can actually speak to these things in a way that feels like it's cutting closer to the heart of things. I know that's really a whiffy, whiffly waffly sort of no, I way mean, of getting at it. Yeah. But that's that's the whole point, right? The whiffly waffly is part of the play. It's like yeah. we're those of us who play, we're constantly wiggling between all the lines. I mean, that's the whole point. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. Thank you. And I think I think I mean one one of the things just to, as a yeah. as a um um a codex to that would be like I think for me personally, I've had to stop being down on myself um for being interested and slash obsessed in um, the meta-ness of, mm -hmm. of our writing, you know, yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the same sort of prejudice that makes people think that this, the thing that is self-conscious or self-reflexive is somehow lesser than the so-called pure mm -hmm. um, or sublime thing. And for me, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, all, all works of art are in a sense about, um, how art works as yeah. well. And yeah. for me, looking back at my books to realize, oh, what, what I'm writing about is how to write in this difficult sort of condition and space. Mm. It's not a preambular, preambular thing. It's not a, um, it's not a clearing of the throat. Uh, you know, it's actually the thing itself as well. And I have to sort of try to honor that impulse um, yeah. in myself and in other writers. Terrific, terrific. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to go to the comments. We do have a question, um, and then we'll just kind of roll with it. If more questions come in, we'll try to answer them. If, if this is the only question, we'll go back to our conversation. Is that cool? Yeah, of course. All right, so it looks like Jasmine Hernandez has a question. How do you feel about Asians being the good minority? Do you ever feel unseen from society itself and feel like Asians are usually not given the resources they should? Let me take a crack at this, Nam, Please. Uh, with my philanthropy hat on, all right? So I work in philanthropy. Um, in terms of philanthrop in philanthropic dollars, Asian Americans receive less than half of 1% of philanthropic dollars um, in the United States. So what does that mean for a hu every hundred dollars in philanthropy, less than one half of one cent goes to the Asian American community. So yes, um, there is definitely a problem um, that Asian, I would say Asian Americans, Southeast Asians, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians are, are very under-resourced. And of course, there's a whole conversation about we need to disaggregate all the data and you know we need to separate pacific islanders and native mm. hawaiians from asian americans cuz it's it's a it's a different set of circumstances and to kind of get at a little bit of this question the last thing i'll say is like it, it's not to say we have it worse or that i i would even say we don't have it better either the way that i prefer to look at it is each historically marginalized group in the United States experiences white supremacy differently. Like each, each of the groups has a different set of um, um, institutionalized structural racism that it affects them. There is overlap. Um, there is like, it's not neat, but I think what we really need to do instead of like comparing the groups and saying like, oh, Asians have it better or have it worse or whatever, is we need to look at each group and ask, what do mm -hmm. they suffer? What do they suffer from, and what do they need, right? Um, and so, as Jasmine kind of hints, um, 
our particular struggle is that everyone kind of assumes that we're we're the good ones there are benefits to that but what a lot of people don't th know is there are also definitely hindrances right and jasmine hints at that a little bit in that that means we're under resourced but it also means that um people are not curious about our people's history and circumstances mm. because they assume we're basically white people when obviously it is so much more complicated than that. Like, um, and so I, I think I'll leave it at there. And I would love to hear your impressions, uh, uh, Nam, as a uh, as a Vietnamese Australian refugee. Yeah, no, thank you, Bao. Um, and I, I mean, you, you, you've yeah, you've just sort of encapsulated it really, you know, eloquently. I think. Um, thank you, Jasmine, for the question. I think um, one of the one of the one of the interesting things about this this good minority this model minority um, myth, um, which comes out of very specific policies as well, you know, in in both uh, you know Australia and the states, whereby only um, you know only very um, you know educated and qualified um, you know, immigrants, potential immigrants in in certain industries and professions would be admitted. Um, I think the power of this myth is that it it when you unpick how the myth was used by by the you know the the engine of of white supremacy, um, it was used basically as a bulwark and as a weapon against other minorities, especially. Um, right against black Americans and saying, look at, look at, look at these guys, like they're, they're doing it fine. So as long as you sort of keep your head down and do what they're doing, you right. too can achieve the quote unquote Australian slash American dream. Yeah. Um, and of course what that, what that instills is a whole bunch of assumptions about the zero sumness of things right. about the fact that marginalized communities have to fight it, um, out amongst themselves on a pre sort of apportioned, um, lot rather than consider the system as a whole and I consider the system as a non-zero sum whole. Um, it homogenizes very disparate groups, um, groups that are disparate, as you say, you know, like the, the notion of Asians being one homogenous group is, um, is outlandish right. and their experiences and histories um, and longevities in our countries is very different too. And so they have different um, etiologies and needs. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a danger too on a secondary level because what it does is it forces um, it forces marginalized communities to um, in some way strategically essentialize themselves in order That's to right. organize, you know, That's and right. that is a really powerful and, 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 and potent good thing in many ways because it, that's how you achieve sort of change mm -hmm. um but that essentialization can run pretty deep and it can it can it can lead into um you know both considerations and non-considerations mm -hmm. that um that cut deep such as the stuff that we were talking about before with yeah, yeah. you know when 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 so-called um marginal communities are at at odds so i think um yeah i think the unseenness uh, is a really is a really good term to describe, um, you know, and a, the, the 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 position and plight of um, of Asians, even though they are they compromise such a you know population wise, um, you know, such such visibility. And I think there is a notion of, I guess, a more um, conceptual unseenness mm -hmm. that needs to be unpicked and picked apart, I think, you know, um, in, in a sense that is deeper than, is there an Asian leading man um, right. on this Marvel movie or right, you know, right, right, right. Let, let's sort of freight and weight everything onto um, these neoliberal figureheads. Like there needs right. to be a deeper sort of consideration of how mm -hmm. that unseenness is actually yep. manufactured yep. and how, um, you know, how we're all complicit in that. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. I, I took a, I got a piece of paper and wrote down strategically essentialized because I think that's exactly it. Um, mm -hmm. We have a couple of questions. We're, I'm going to try to keep it moving here. Um, uh, Tabitha, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name, Chanarak asks, did you ever experience pushback from your family for pursuing poetry? Sometimes it feels like my family has a select few <laughs> acceptable careers. And I was wondering if you had to 
overcome that. I'm going to give a 30 second response and then Nam, you take it. No, um, I do it. So, so what I'll say is yes, but I think there's some context. Uh, Vietnamese culture, we love poetry. Both my parents love poetry. So there was pushback, but a lot of that was, I think, a survival reflex of them being refugees to a country. We, they survived war. We're a big, poor refugee family. Um, it's not that they don't love poetry. It was basically they wanted me to get a job to be able to support myself and in some way support them and the rest of my family. Awesome. You know what? I'm, 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 I'm totally, I'm totally going to piggyback on that. You know, it's um, everything that Bao said, but also in my particular case, um, there was this weird sort of thing where I was meant to be, um, well, I actually, they wanted me to be a doctor and then law was the compromise. I was meant to be a lawyer. And then I went off and became a writer. Um, and it was funny because as soon as, as soon as my um, first book came out, um, and it sort of hit the visible and conventional um, benchmarks of success. So it appeared in the local paper and, um, you know, it won this or that thing. Um, then my parents, I, I still remember dad would come up to me um, and he would, he would now sort of like put on his, um, his hat of, I've always loved literature. And, you know, I wanted to be a writer too when I was, growing up and, you know, have you read this and that? Yeah. Um, and so there was very much a sense of, I mean, I think it's true to say that um, poetry as a calling or as a, um, you know, a, a vocation, I guess, that um, that speaks to the heart of things and that assumes enormous moral authority is one that is very, very present in, in our culture. Yeah, um and so there is very much a um, a respect and dignity that is accorded to that. But as you say, Bao, in terms of like the survival reflex that is activated um, upon immigration and as a result of the trauma of um, how that immigration occurred as well, uh, it's it's it, it has to be um, as a coping mechanism. It has to be buried. And so, in a way, what what we can do is um, exhume all of that and have, you know, the rest of the stuff to deal with that is exhumed along with it as well, because it's not just all, it's not just all roses. Absolutely. All right. So we have a little under three minutes left. Uh, I'm going to let you take this one. Do you write only in English? Other languages work with translation. So I know Nam, you use uh, Vietnamese words and phrasing in your poems, but also your short story collection uh, has been translated into numerous languages. So for the next two minutes, answer it however you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do only write, um, thanks Donna for your question. I do only write in English. Um, I speak kitchen Vietnamese um, with my parents. Uh, to my to my shame and sadness not not with my kids um and i don't read uh or write vietnamese at all um i mean i can i can read it at sort of crep or grade one level um but in terms of working with translations and other languages um I'm, i've always been really attracted to the notion of um of translations or sometimes called imitations where poets who don't speak um the, the the you know the source language um read and then work from transliterations or translations um and then sort of take enormous liberties um with that material as well i think some of the most wonderful poetry that i've sort of um found really generative have been sort of imitations or translations and so you know in as much as you can um i think it's you'd be you'd be uh you'd be a fool not to draw from other tra traditions um but it's hard to sort of escape that initial sort of bump of well as a poet you're dealing with language as at its most particular and specific and so you don't if you don't have that in the other language you also have to sort of have the lens of i am denuding myself of that particular appreciation but i know that there is other stuff that i can get um and i'm just going to foreground my own subjectivity in these so-called translations Beautiful. With 
19 seconds to spare. So I think I'm going to call uh, Annie back because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we have to end. Um, Nam, it's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. Those of you who haven't no, gotten the book, it, yeah, no, uh, uh, again, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Majors of Gwyn. Those of you who have not gotten the book yet, get the book. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Get it for your friends, too. Yes, thank you both so much. That was such a fantastic conversation. Thanks, guys, for tuning in and your questions. And as Bo says, please check out the book. Um, I did put a link to the Majors of Quinn website in the chat, so you can head on over there if you want to get the book from us. Um, or um, if you would like to support your own local bookstore, wherever you may be watching from, please do that. All right. Thank you so much. And We'll have a, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys.